When I first began in game development, the hardest part for me was always starting something new, creating a new system or a new game where nothing existed. Working on existing projects and adding things was quite a bit easier, but coming up with something just fresh and new and building that out was always kind of a complicated thing that really frustrated me. I'd wonder, what do I do? How do I start? How do I go about this process? But over the years, I've come up with a process that I use to make it a lot easier for myself so that I can come up with a concept, prototype it out in an hour or two, and then turn it into a somewhat working game in a day or two. And I wanna run you through that process right now. I'll show you all of the steps that I follow and how easy it can be and probably help you to stop overthinking and overcomplicating your process and your projects along the way. So if you're into game development or you just wanna get a little bit better at it or you wanna see what I'm doing and how I go about the process, make sure that you're subscribed, hit the like button. It makes a big difference, it really helps. And if you have your own process, or questions about mine, just drop a comment down below and let me know, I'm really curious. Before we get started, I wanted to make one quick announcement. Backtrace, this video sponsor, is hosting a game jam next weekend, June 24th. Backtrace is the best solution for error and crash reporting in your video games, and they really support the game development community with these Backtrace game jams. So I definitely recommend you go check it out, sign up for their free developer program, and enter the game jam, see if you can win $2,000, and get some experience with an awesome tool at the same time. Let's get to the steps. The first thing that I like to do when I'm building out a system is really quickly think through what it is I'm building. For this video, I'm gonna build out a simple fighting system. I imagine I'm building out a fighting game like a Street Fighter or some other combat-based game where my characters need to attack each other and I need to figure out how I'm gonna deal with attacks and how I'm gonna deal with combat in a game. So let's get started with the first thing that I would do, which is put in some characters into my game. Here you can see I've got a werewolf wolf and a dragon. I want to have something there so that I can see what's happening, kind of visualize it and keep myself entertained and really adding in assets is extremely easy. If you're curious what these are, I'll have a link down below to the full pack so you can go check it out. After I pull in my characters, I like to set up the animators so that I can see what's going on without always having to read debug logs. I create an animator controller for my wolf or one of my characters, and in there I set up an idle state as the default, create an attack state that can be triggered by an attack trigger parameter, and a die state that can be triggered by a die trigger parameter. That way I can see if my characters are attacking, if they're dying, and I can even hook things up to animation events later on if I so decide to. For my dragon, I just create an override controller and implement the exact same animation so that I don't have to have two of them. And then if my characters are animating properly, which it looks like they are, I move on to writing code. Since we're dealing with two characters fighting, I think that a good name for a script would be character, so I made a character script and I just assign it to both of them. Let's open up the script and see what a first iteration of a character script would look like. Let's take a look at the character script now. I want you to notice something. First off, it's extremely simple, and this is how all of my code starts. I like to start with something that's really easy to understand, that's not complicated and not making any guesses or assumptions about what I'm going to do. This first version just gets the animator in the onValidate, caches it, and then has a method to attack a character. I know that I want to attack a character, so I put in a method called attack, give it a character parameter that I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with yet, but just leave it there as a hint for myself. And then I tell my animator to set the attack trigger. Now, if I just try to run with this, it's obviously not gonna do anything because I'm not calling attack yet. And this is where things start to get a little bit confusing sometimes. Think like, well, now I need to figure out how and when my character is going to attack. So let's build up some system in the character to figure that out. I'm gonna say, don't do that yet. Let's skip it and make it attack whenever we want so that we can get this attack flow working right and then worry about the timing of the attack. Let's get this part done and then worry about the next thing. We don't need to do that yet. So to make an attack method callable, we'll just create an extra script. Here we've created a character attacker script that has two character references, C1 and C2. I even got sloppy on the names because I want to remember that this is a throwaway script that I'm using to test myself. I've made them public again because it's just a thing that I'm using to test my attack steps and build that up. It'll probably get refactored, deleted, or replaced with something else later on. I've got an update method here that checks to see if I hit one or two. If I hit one, it makes character one attack character two. If I hit two, it makes 
character two, attack character one. It's going to be very easy to test my system and build up around this. To put that into the game, I just created a character attacker game object, attached it, and now I just need to assign character one and assign character two. Ta-da, now I can call my attacks. Let's press play, and I should be able to hit one and watch my wolf swing at the dragon. And I can hit two and watch the dragon do a tail swipe. There we go, we've got our first step done. The next step is to add some health and make these characters actually die. To do that, I'm gonna go right back into the character script and we'll add in a couple new fields. We'll add a maximum health field, something that will define how much health the character has and I'll make this a serialized field so that I can modify this per character. It might be something that each individual character has a different value for. It might be all the same. It might be something that I just want to adjust, but I'm going to make sure that it's available for me there on my prefabs. We'll also keep track of our current health, and then in a start method, we'll set the current health to max health. Relatively simple stuff. By the way, if you haven't seen this syntax before, it's an expression body method. It's just an easy way to do a one-liner method without having all the extra braces. Nothing special there, but it looks a little bit different. I do the same in on validate. You may have noticed that. I want to call it out in case you're not familiar with them. The one thing that we have changed here, the big thing that I have changed, is that inside the attack method, we actually decrement the current health. So on line 16 now, I say character dot underscore current health minus minus. That's going to remove one health from it. And then if the health gets down to zero or somehow below zero, we'll destroy that character's game object. It's important to note here, the character that we're destroying is the one that's being passed in. That's the target that's being sent in from my character fight script or my character attacker script. So it has access to this current health because we're inside the character script or the character class. That's another thing that people may not know that you can do if you're in a private field or you can access a private field from another instance of a class if you're on a class. So one character can access another character's health because they're both the same class. Something that people may get a little bit confused about. I just want to make sure that you understand that this is the target character. In fact, I might even go about renaming this if I wasn't sure about that to target character or just target. To see this in action, I've got my dragon selected in debug mode so I can see the max and current health. The current already got set up to five. I'm going to swing and attack, swing and attack, swing and attack, and look at that. It kills off my dragon. I do notice something though. If I attack really, really fast, it swings and it just kills him every time I click. So it's not actually waiting for an attack. See, I can just spam like that and he just dies. So let's add in the next step. My next step would be to make this thing feel a little bit more real. Right now the damage is done immediately on attack and I wanna delay that, make it so that it hits when we actually hit with our character. That's an easy thing to do in Unity. So I go to my werewolf, select the animation for him. Once I found his animation, I just drag out the preview window to the point where I want him to be hitting. If you don't see your character there, you just drag the character down from the scene view into here and you'll see that character. Once I'm at the point where I think he should be hitting, which is probably like right about here, then I'll add in an event. On, under the events section, I can hit the plus button and let's call this attack land. And then we go down, hit the apply button, and now I've got an animation event that will allow me to fix my timing. I can jump back over to my code, and then we can add in an attack land method. With my attack land method, I'll actually do something that I don't normally do, which is add in a comment. I usually do this when I have something that's called by an animation event because things don't detect it, and it looks like it's unused, and it's very likely that somebody will accidentally delete a method because it's called by an animation event and not shown as referenced in here. I've had it happen more than once, so I add a comment every time now. But if I want to move my code here to do this damage into the attack land, and I just do a cut and paste, I'm going to get a problem because I don't have a reference to that character anymore. So I'll come up with the next simple, 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 simple fix. Got to get my word out there. But the simple fix is to just cache this character as a target. So I'd take my character, say underscore target equals character, add in a field for it, hit alt enter, and just create a nice character field right up there at the top. So I'd have a character field that's getting set in the attack. And then in the attack land, well, obviously we'll just replace character with target. So I copy it, paste it over there, and now we'll have a nice delayed attack land. Now, before this will all work, I've got to make sure to add the attack land to my tail attack here on the dragon so that he can fight back. So I'll add attack 
land as an animation event and apply the changes. But with that, I should be able to hit play and then test out and see my characters fighting. Let's give it a shot. So I hit play and I've got both of the characters here in debug property windows. By the way, if you haven't used that before, just right click hit properties. You get a nice window that's locked to whatever object. I've got them in debug mode so I can see them attack. The wolf swings, small delay. You can see the health go down on the dragon. Same with the dragon. Bam, the health goes down on the wolf as soon as the hit actually lands. Now I can attack and my characters disappear and that's cool and all, but not quite what I want. I want that death animation to play and for the corpse to disappear. So then I'll move on to my next step, thinking about how do I want to deal with the death animation and making the corpses poof. Well, first thing I want to do is just play the death animation. So let's go to the part where our character dies in the attack land. And instead of destroying the character, let's just play a death animation. So we can cut this line and say animator.setTrigger and here I'll call die. Now, one thing that I'll notice along the way is that Rider is recommending that I turn my animation properties into something that's cached for performance. It's a small performance improvement, but it's something that Rider recommends, and I generally like to follow along with using these cached property indexes. So I'll hit Alt-Enter and allow it to generate the index up here. So you see it just creates an integer that's kind of mapping that name to an ID, makes it a little bit faster for the lookup. I do the same for my attack, Alt-Enter, and create a cached property index. And then I rename both of these to all uppercase kind of screaming caps so that I know that these are static things that aren't things I'm actually using as um, like a variable that's changing. These are things that are only supposed to be meant to use as like a constant variable that doesn't change. That's, that's how I use my screaming caps at least. So one minor improvement while we're going along and I recommend that you do this the entire time. As you see little things that you can fix along the way, just keep kind of minorly fixing them. So I've got my animator trigger to set it to die. So now it should just play a death animation. Let's see if that works and jump over. I usually want to test it out, make sure that the death animation is playing and that we actually see ourselves die. So attack, 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 attack. And on the fifth attack, I should expect to see a death animation. Cool. Except notice that it was on the attacker. So I know I've already got an issue. We'll jump back over here and we'll say underscore target dot animator dot set trigger. Now this part is where I start to think like, ah, this is getting a little bit confusing because I have to reference this target object and it's not my own object. And it's kind of confusing on like what thing I'm doing. And I can see that I'm probably going to make that mistake again. In fact, I literally made that mistake accidentally because it's easy to do here. So the fix for this is to take this bit of code in the attack land and extract it. I hit control shift R. That's my default hotkey, but just look for your hotkey to extract method and I'll hit extract method. And then we'll call this take hit. Our take hit method needs to be called on the actual target though, not on ourselves. So if I just call it like this, it's really no different. I want to change this and say underscore target dot take hit. Then I can remove the references to target inside of this take hit method because it's now on that actual character. So when we land an attack, we'll tell our target to take a hit and then the target will deal with taking its own hit and setting its animator. If I save that off, I should be able to now watch my character animate his death when I hit him five times. Let's hit play. Let the wolf hit the dragon five times. And look at that. His animation plays perfectly. Now that we've got the character dying, I want to make two more little changes. I want to make it so that he won't die over and over and so that his body actually poofs and disappears. That's again, really simple to do. We'll go back into the character script and to poof the corpse, we can just go down into the part where we set the death trigger, add in some braces and then call this handy little destroy method. We'll call it destroy on our game object and just give it a delay. If you didn't know you could do that, when you want to destroy a game object, if you need to do it after some time, just add in a second parameter that's a wait time or delay, it'll destroy the object after that amount of time. The other thing that we want to do is make sure that we only decrement health or take damage if we are below or above zero. So we'll say if current health is less than or equal to zero before we take the damage, then we'll just return and early exit out. Now we shouldn't take multiple hits and our corpse should just clean itself up. All right, let's attack, 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 kill him. And he doesn't keep playing that animation and eventually the corpse poofs. So that's kind of the process. And from here, I just keep going on adding in different things, whatever the next piece I want is, whether it's a different type of attack, some healing, some health bars or whatever it is. But this is kind of the general process. 
piece by piece, nice and slow, without trying to pre-guess and pre-plan everything. If this was helpful for you at all, please make sure that you hit the like button, subscribe, hit the thumbs up, share the thing, and all of that other cool stuff. And also check out the video's sponsor, Backtrace. Go join their game jam. Building out games is a good way to force yourself to do it really fast in these game jams because you only got a couple hours to do it. So it makes you go through this process of building it quick, getting the working thing out there and done so that you're not sitting there overcomplicating and overthinking it. Again, if it was helpful, let me know, drop a comment, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.